The next section in this uh, discourse is about the abandoning of the hindrances. Now, I have mentioned the hindrances as being part of the fourth foundation of mindfulness to become aware of the content of the mind if any of the hindrances have arisen. But here we have another um, way of seeing how the Buddha actually expressed himself and also maybe a little more detail on it. And because this is an extremely important aspect, we really need to know them. We really need to remember what they are so that we can recognize them. I'll read the first little uh, paragraph. Endowed with the noble aggregate of moral discipline, the noble restraint over the sense faculties, noble mindfulness and clear comprehension, and noble contentment. Now, obviously, these are all the parts of this sutta that have already gone before this. The moral discipline, restraint of the sense faculties, mindfulness and clear comprehension, and contentment. These were all the aspects that the Buddha mentioned are necessary in order to have the um, pathway clear for the meditation and the um, insight. He resorts to a secluded dwelling, a forest, the foot of a tree, a mountain, a glen, a hillside cave, a cremation ground, a jungle grove, the open air, a heap of straw. It's not mentioned a house or a, or a hut or anything like that. However, in the commentaries it says that it's not so much the kind of house that one dwells in, it is the seclusion of it, the secluded dwelling, well it says dwelling here, um, the seclusion, that there is quiet, that one doesn't live in the midst of enormous activity. And this is one of the drawbacks of our big cities, everywhere in the world, not just here, in the United States, but anywhere in the world, the big cities are the most difficult places to have a quiet spot. And most people who do want a quiet spot do get outside of them. The foot of a tree is interesting. It doesn't just mean sitting at the foot of a tree, because there is a tree in India and also in Sri Lanka, you can see that, it has what are called buttress roots. The roots are above the ground. They are sometimes as high as this, sometimes as high as that, or as this, and they are sort of rounded, and they go around like that. So if you're sitting inside, you're sitting like in a little house, and the tree itself is your roof. And they're, they're really lovely places to meditate. Trees have a sort of a... I don't know if you've noticed that, but it's very noticeable in the redwood trees of California. Trees have strength. There's a feeling of protectedness. There's strength, and there's a, also a feeling of rootedness. So the Buddha was born under a tree. He attained enlightenment under a tree, and he died under a tree. And he often said to, just like he says here, to go to a forest to meditate, to go to the foot of a tree, to a glen, a hillside cave, then of course the cremation ground. Uh, the cremation ground is mentioned because there are the cemetery meditation um, methods which are better done at a cremation ground and that would be hard to do in our society because that's not where you can sit. Cremation grounds don't even exist here in our society. They do that in a very um, hygienic uh, building. A jungle grove, open air, a heap of straw. The, um, 
the, the, the trees that were, this, this particular tree, it's very common in India. It's all over the place. And uh, it has, it's usually enormously big. So that even in bad weather, even if the weather is not uh, perfect, you're still protected from the weather. So it's, um, it's a very nice place to be. So he says one resorts to a secluded dwelling. In other words, one has it nice and quiet, like we seem to be having it here now. After returning... <laughs> why, was that noise again? <laughs> no. Oh, I see. Oh, right, I forgot that. <laughs> After returning uh, from the arms round, is getting the meal, following his meal, he sits down, crosses his legs, holds his body erect, and sets up mindfulness before him. Now the word sets up mindfulness before him is often <coughs> a surprising way of expressing it. The mindfulness before him, it's in the Patipatthana Sutta also like that. To set up mindfulness before one means that one is watching the breath. The, the breath as it comes out and goes in and comes out and goes in. Because the mindfulness that we're setting up is very often right here where the breath comes in and out. And so it, this is what it's all, what it means. So the uh, abandoning of the hindrances are here explained in the context of meditation. How they have to be abandoned in order to meditate. Of course they do, they do have the context of having to abandon them in daily life also. But they are here explained in the context of the meditative um, process. Having abandoned covetousness for the world, he dwells with a mind free from covetousness, purifies the mind from covetousness. Now that to covet is the desire for sensual gratification or greed, if one would like a nice short word which tells it quite clearly and which is the first hindrance and in order to meditate properly of course there has to be the seclusion from sensual desire if we have sensual desire while we're trying to meditate it's just impossible no way and if the sensual desire is too strong in one one can't get to the meditation, the mind is uh, excited. So sensual desire could be for any one of the uh, things that are available to us. It can be for food and drink, it can be for another person, it can be for objects, ownership of objects, it can be for physical comfort, any kind of desire which arises in the mind stops the meditative path very effectively. Now the commentary tells what to do about that. This is quite interesting. The Buddha does not say that here, what he should do, what the king should do. He's talking to the king, as he was all the time. But here it says there are six things that need to be developed for the abandoning of sensual desire. Learning the signs of the unattractive, which is what I have already explained as the five noble powers. Seeing the unattractive, we can use the word attractive instead of delightful, um, seeing the unattractive and the attractive. And of course, vice versa, seeing the attractive and the unattractive. But here, we are concerned with greed, with the wanting. So we need to balance that with, with seeing the unattractive. That's the balancing. And because this is the middle path, we always have to balance. The whole thing is a balancing act. It's never an extreme in one way or another. It's always a balance. And because 
people often don't know where the balance is. That's why then the path is not clear, because they overdo one or the other, the turning away or the turning towards. One or the other is overdone. So, the si- learning the sign of the unattractive, to see that which is unattractive in their practice. So what's unattractive? Unattractive is that everything is impermanent and falls apart. And if one has, for instance, taking, done this, um, opening the body with as if it, if it had a zipper and taking out the bits and pieces, one can from that infer without a shadow of a doubt that everybody has those bits and pieces inside. So what's so attractive about that? So if we have an enormous attraction, we have to see the unattractive. If it is an object, any kind of object that we want, then we can see that that too will fall apart, that it has to, needs to be looked after, that it is, uh, has all sorts of impediments. That's a word the Buddha uses for material objects. There are impediments with each material object. Look at any material object that you've ever owned or own now. Each one has an impediment. None of it can be just left to its own devices. They have to be looked after, they have to be cleaned, they have to be uh, locked up, they have to be replaced, they have to be fixed. And if you just look at cars, automobiles, I mean, the whole misery becomes very clear, doesn't it? It's one of the most miserable things to own, and yet people need it. So that's one of the things to do. When desire arises, immediately to see the other side. When when we have desire for something, obviously we think it's extremely attractive, otherwise we wouldn't desire it. We would think it's very attractive and that it will make us very happy, otherwise we wouldn't want it. Right? So, at that time, to see the unattractive will give us a balance. It will not make us disgusted because we're already overboard on the attractive side. So, if we then put on the unattractive, we are in the middle. Using the unattractive as a meditation subject, if it's very strong, if it's a very strong desire, to use that attraction and see the unattractive as a meditation subject. Keeping the doors of the sense faculties guarded, not to look for the things that we might have, that we might want, but guarding them. Moderation in eating. It's very interesting that that particular sense desire or sense sensual gratification is mentioned separately because it is one it is the easiest to gratify and it's also the easiest to go overboard no extremes the Buddha does not say not to eat to be moderate it's a it's a, a balance to have a balance in it noble friendship and then it says suitable talk Usually it's called noble conversations, but that doesn't matter. It's either way, suitable talk. And I have mentioned that already, that how important the Buddha uh, mentioned, the importance that the Buddha mentioned for the right kind of friends. And you will see as we go through the hindrances, it's mentioned every time, and even in more, <clears throat> even stronger, that the kind of people that one associates with. How helpful that can be. If those people are noble people, that means that they are also striving for the higher idea and not just enmeshed in worldly affairs. And if one is oneself engaged in this endeavor as we are here, one does find those friends birds of a feather flock together. It is a very natural law that those people who have the same interests do find each other and that one has that kind of support system. 
The Buddha compares the, um, the sensual desire. He says like this, Great king, suppose a man were to take a loan and apply it to his business, and his business were to succeed so that he could pay back his old debts and would have enough money left over to maintain a wife. He would reflect on this, and as a result, he would become glad and experience joy. He's um, comparing sensual desire to being in debt, to have the debt to these sense contacts that one is looking for. And because of that, if we are in debt to our senses, we don't have any freedom because we're, we always have to comply with that urge. It's an urge, it's an, it's an oppression, we're oppressed by that urge. If we can shake that free, it's a feeling of freedom. We, that, that doesn't mean that we don't have any pleasant sense contacts. Obviously we do. It would be quite uh, impossible not to. We also will have unpleasant ones. It's impossible not to. But the urge, for the sense contact. But it also does not mean to be disgusted with one's sense contact, but to recognize how they operate, and I have already explained that with the aggregates. So he's comparing, he's saying that if you have paid your debt off and you've got money left over for your family, you'd be jo- joyful and glad. And that means that if you haven't got the sensual desire, you have a feeling of freedom and gladness which will help you to meditate. The whole thing is geared towards meditation because the next sector will then talk about the meditation. The next, the second um, hindrance, having abandoned ill will and hatred, one dwells with a benevolent mind sympathetic for the welfare of all living beings and purifies the mind from ill will and hatred. This second um, hindrance to be abandoned as he is talking about meditation, it's quite obvious that one can't sit down and meditate if one is angry at somebody. If one's angry, one's angry. But then the mind just takes on like a dynamic of its own. If there is anger in the mind, or even sadness, or sensual desire, or any of these things, the mind's dynamic is that it churns. It's churning, and it can't meditate. A churning mind cannot meditate. That's why the Buddha is giving the instructions to first get make sure that the mind is at ease and then it can do this. Now the the six things to be developed for abandoning ill will. Learning the sign of loving kindness. Well, the sign is the meditative um, ability for or let's say the sign of loving kindness get the feeling of loving kindness and then the second one they apply that in the meditation on loving kindness so and the reason I'm using so many different ways of doing loving kindness meditation is to find something whatever it is to get the feeling and then use that feeling to do the loving kindness meditation. The um, number of different ways of getting that feeling is only limited by one's own imagination, that's all. Just so the feeling comes. And loving kindness, that kind of love, is not possession, possessive. It's certainly not um, asking for... uh, Reciprocation, it uh, has nothing to do with the uh, desirability of the object or the subject. It's developing the quality of love in the heart. That's all that this is about. 
to develop the quality of love in the heart is one of the most important, cannot even be stated enough, most important support systems for meditation. That particular one, whoever has it, can meditate. Whoever's got it just a little can meditate a little. The more we bring it up, even if we don't have it in daily life, if we have it just for the meditation period, it will grow and flourish because the meditation then helps to make it grow and flourish. So that's the, the feeling, the sign, the feeling, the, the feeling of loving kindness and then the application to the meditation on loving kindness. And then reflection on the ownership of action, which means karma. Reflection on the fact that anything negative that goes on in the mind belongs to me. It's my karma. Making bad karma belongs to me. Is it worth it? Is it worth it to make bad karma just because somebody is like this or like that? One can actually um, evaluate that. Is it worth it or is it better not? An abundance of wise reflection. This wise reflection is mentioned by the Buddha over and over again. It's my, probably one of the most often used words in the description of gaining insight. Wise reflection. Now this gets us to that point which people ask quite often and I've uh, been asked here too. But that's thinking. Well, we're not going to um, have a vegetable mind, are we? The only thing that's ever going to become enlightened is the mind. So we're not going to cut it out. We're just not going to think discursive thoughts, if we can possibly help it. But we use the mind for wise reflection, and wise reflection brings insight. So we reflect on those aspects of the teaching, which help us to gain more insight into absolute reality. And in this case, a wise reflection will, for instance, go to making good or bad karma with one's own hatred or one's own love. That's a wise reflection. A wise reflection may be when we have a passionate desire for a person to see that that person also has dukkha and that that isn't going to be the fulfillment of our lives to have that person because we can't have anybody anyway. We can't even have this person, so how about another person? So that's, that's my fear. Anything that brings insight into the aspects of anicca, dukkha, and anatta in all their various forms, that's wise reflection. And then noble friendship and suitable talk. Now again, that's the same one, the same two again. To have noble friends and to have suitable conversations. Now we heard yesterday what suitable conversations are. There are ten topics which are suitable, which all are within Dhamma. And noble friends, I've already talked about it, what that means, that we also can be noble friends. We don't have to wait that somebody is our noble friend, although that's very good, but we can also be a noble friend. And then uh, the Buddha gives a simile. Again, great king, suppose a person were to become sick, afflicted, gravely ill, so that he could not enjoy his food and his strength would decline. After some time he would recover from that illness would enjoy his food, regain his bodily strength, he would reflect on this, and as a result, he would become glad and experience joy. So what the Buddha is saying there is that we reflect on the absence of our defilements. If we know that we are feeling love, love and uh, compassion for others, we reflect upon that, because that brings joy and gladness that we were able to feel like that 
And if we have no sensual desire or are able to overcome the sensual desire, we reflect on that. If we have not overcome it, we reflect wisely how to overcome it. So our reflection is always a way of gaining more insight. Become more and more aware of where our good strong points are and where our weak points are. With as much honesty and clarity as we can possibly muster. Now the third one, it's called dullness and drowsiness here. I've been calling it cloth and torpor, but I think dullness and drowsiness is nicer. It's a newer translation. I like it better. Having abandoned dullness and drowsiness, one dwells perceiving light, mindful and clearly comprehending, and purifies the mind from dullness and drowsiness. Now that's the third hindrance. And that's strictly referring to the mind. The mind is dull, the mind is drowsy. And perceiving light means nothing other than when there is dullness and drowsiness to make sure that the eyes open and look at the light because that brings um, new energy. A mind which is dull and drowsy is a mind without energy and a mind without energy cannot possibly meditate. The more negativity we have in us, the less mental energy. Negativity is the most, um, uses up the most mental energy. The more positivity we have, the stronger is the energy. And we can feel that from anybody, even not only just from ourselves, but from other people also. The uh, positivity of being at ease, equanimous, and joyful brings always new energy. So dullness and drowsiness of the mind, sometimes it is due to uh, physical tiredness that cannot be helped, but if it is strictly due to the fact that the mind just can't rouse its energy, it just can't, can't be bothered, then perceiving light means to look at the light. Open the eyes and look at the light. Mindful and clearly comprehending, becoming aware of this um, difficulty, of this hindrance, and uh, comprehending it seeing with clear comprehension, does this help me to gain insight into anicca, dukkha, anatta? Well, surely not. So maybe I should rouse the mind to do something better. The six things to be developed for abandoning dullness and drowsiness are recognizing that overeating is the basis for dullness and drowsiness which is quite easily seen that when one has had a big meal um, it's quite impossible to meditate right after that. If necessary, changing one's posture. Attention to the perception of light. Now the perception of light, if one is a skilled meditator, one can bring up the light in one's mind. But if one is not that skilled, one just looks at the light either the window or the electric light or the candles or anything like that. A skilled meditator can bring up the perception of light in the mind, but if that is not the case, outside light will do. Living in the open air, uh, having enough oxygen around, <laughs> having fresh air, and again, noble friendship and suitable talk, recognizing the danger of dullness and drowsiness. That danger is only recognized at the moment when we see the urgency. That there's nothing more urgent than this practice. The Buddha compared this, that we are children that are playing in a house on fire. And first of all, we don't even know that the house is on fire because we're kids. And secondly, we don't want to let go of our toys. So we don't jump out. And the house on fire is a hole of samsara, full of dukkha, full of fire of passion, of wanting and not wanting. 
and if we think that we can ever find a place where there is no burning, we're mistaken, because once the house is on fire, it will burn down. So, the, um, the urgency only arises when we see that. And with that urgency, then, we will see that there is, it's necessary to arouse the mind from dullness and drowsiness. The, uh, the dullness of the mind is a little different from the drowsiness. The drowsiness can be because, as I said, of tiredness. And that can be quite uh, um, justified tiredness. But the dullness of mind is something else. The dullness of mind is a mind that doesn't understand. And there are two possibilities. One is that one hasn't trained one's mind enough to understand what goes on. And the other one is what one doesn't want to understand. Because it could be a bother. So there are these two possibilities arise. For a meditator, it's uh, not common that they don't want to understand, but it also happens. Because one may come to the meditation in order to have peacefulness, just like this king, he wants a bit of peacefulness. He doesn't really want to know everything, but um, eventually, of course, one sees the necessity for insight. If one has come to the meditation just to have peacefulness, it doesn't matter if eventually the mind recognizes the fact that that's not enough, that there has to be insight, because peacefulness and meditation also doesn't last. Now there's a give a simile for this dullness and drowsiness. Again, great king, suppose a man were locked up in a prison. After some time he would be released from prison, safe and secure, with no loss of his possessions. He would reflect on this, and as a result he would become glad and experience joy. Again, we can reflect upon the fact that our mind is energetic and clear, and be happy about that. In other words, all of the hindrances, if we see that we don't have them, particularly at the time of meditation, the reflection upon that is a cause for joy. And although joy is also one of the steps in the meditation, it is an absolute essential factor for the start of proper meditation. Um, Here's another simile given from the commentary about this dullness and drowsiness. A man is placed in prison on a festival day. On a later festival day he thinks, Previously, to my, due to my own heedlessness, I was bound in prison, and I did not enjoy that festival, but now I will be heedful. Heedful, heedful is another word for being mindful, and paying attention. Thus he becomes heedful, so that his foes do not get the chance to have him imprisoned. And having enjoyed the festival, he utters a joyful exclamation, Oh, what a wonderful festival! Similarly, what a meditator thinks, dullness and drowsiness are a major cause of harm. So he develops the six things and abandons the hindrance of dullness and drowsiness. And when he has thus abandoned them, then just as a man freed from imprisonment <coughs> enjoys the beginning, middle and end of the festival even for a week, so the meditator enjoys the beginning, middle and end of the festival of Dhamma and attains arahantship together with the analytical knowledges. I'll explain those some other time, the analytical knowledges. Therefore, the exalted one says that the abandonment of dullness and drowsiness is like release from prison. But this is another explanation of why it is so important to let that go, um, which comes from the commentary. The first one which I read is the Buddha's own words. And then the commentary uh, detail it more, give more detail. But this one is very nicely done. So I thought it would be worthwhile uh, uh, reading it out. Because the, the joy of not being dull and drowsy is very important. 
And he says when one can do that, one can even attain arahatship. Now the fourth one, a fourth of our hindrances. Having abandoned restlessness and worry, one dwells at ease within oneself with a peaceful mind and purifies the mind from restlessness and worry. Now see, restlessness and worry, according to these words, is the, are the ones that take away most of the peace. Worry is, of course, absurd. Everybody knows that, but yet people worry. It's uh, the person who worries about the future is not the same person who is going to experience the future. So it's totally absurd to worry about it. The changing every second. And what we are worrying about today may leave us completely cold next year. We have no interest anymore in it. So to worry about it now is an absurdity. And all it does, it churns the mind up. It's, uh, it's never, never connected to the here now. It's never connected to this moment. And the only time that we can live is in this moment. Everything else is conjecture a hope and a prayer and they don't work so there's no need to worry about anything because it isn't happening the only thing that's happening is this one moment and besides that that we can't experience it same person can't experience it and the restlessness is unfortunately a feature of humanity in fact, it's a feature of all living beings who are not enlightened. If you like to watch one of the birds one of these days, you will see the restlessness. They're not just pretty feathered companions. They are actually a mirror. They are completely restless. You will hardly ever see a bird that's not moving, even when it's sitting still. It's always looking around. It's constantly moving because it's afraid. It's afraid to be attacked. It's afraid for its life. It's afraid that its um, food will be taken away. You can see the restlessness in the bird and relate it to yourself. When we have been sitting long enough, we would like to get up. When we've been standing long enough, we'd like to sit down again. If that's no longer um, applicable, then we want to lie down. Have we been lying down long enough? We want to get up again. Have we been reading long enough? We want to take a rest from that. There's always something we want to do. We're never completely at ease. And it only goes away for the non-returner. However, on the way to non-returner we can work on that and see it clearly that it is a feature of the dukkha of existence because we don't have complete fulfillment within so the restlessness which arises is that we are looking for complete fulfillment no matter where and how and when and what. And because we haven't got it yet, naturally we're looking here and there. If the heart and mind were totally and completely fulfilled and didn't have any kind of lack, any kind of anything missing at all, then there would be no longer any restlessness. That is only possible when the me illusion has been so um, minimized that it doesn't have any effect anymore. In fact, it actually needs a complete loss of it, never to return again, so that restlessness is totally el eliminated. 
So at this point in time, when it is still there, we need to see that it has the effect of disturbing meditation. Because we can't be at ease and peaceful. So what we need to do at the time of beginning meditation, if the mind is playing tricks, to have the wise consideration that there's nothing to be restless about. There's nowhere to go and nothing to do. We are already that what we would like to become. We just haven't noticed it yet. That's all. So there's absolutely nothing to be done. And if that will help, or anything else, to quieten the mind, to be at ease, to say there is nothing that needs to be achieved or anything that needs to be known. Everything is already known because it, it slumbers within us. We just got to get there. Then the mind may have less restlessness in it, be more likely to con concentrate. the six things to help one to abandon worry and restlessness. Much learning, which means Dhamma learning. It doesn't mean information about extraneous things. It means the learning of the Dhamma. Interrogation, which means questioning. Questioning about the Dhamma so that everything becomes clear how it all fits together how this is a huge picture consisting of bits and pieces like a jigsaw puzzle that all fit together and make one beautiful whole tapestry questioning skill in the Vinaya, the Vinaya applies only to monks and nuns. So one would say that this skill should be the skill of moral discipline, restraint of the senses, mindfulness and clear comprehension and contentment. Those would be the skills that one should learn. Associating with wise people and noble friendship and suitable talk. So here we don't have just noble friendship, we have also the association with wise people. The association with, it's quite definitely meant, association with such people who have the knowledge of the Dhamma and can show the, the way within the Dhamma. This is what is uh, meant here. The simile the Buddha gives, Great King, suppose a man were a slave without independence, subservient to others, unable to go where he wants. After some time he would be released from slavery and gain his independence. He would no longer be subservient to others, but a free man, able to go where he wants. He would reflect on this, and as a result he would become glad and experience joy. So, the Buddha is comparing restlessness and worry to being a slave. And restlessness and worry do that. They push one around. One and one is no longer able to do with the mind what one wants to do. They push one somewhere. And then one is inclined to think that all of this stuff that one is worrying about and that one is restless about is justified. Because the mind is doing that. This is the worst mistake one can make. This is a lack then of clear comprehension. Anything that doesn't help to see anicca dukkha or anatta is not justifiable. It's just a thought process. That's all. Anything that fosters sensual desire, ill will, dullness and drowsiness, Restlessness and worry, anything that fosters any of that is the wrong way, going in the wrong direction. 
And if we go in the wrong direction, we shouldn't be surprised if the meditation doesn't work. Meditation is not possible as an extra activity piled on top of all the other worldly activities. It just doesn't work that way. Meditation has to be embedded in this whole aspect that the Buddha is explaining here to the king. You will come to the meditation as the next step. It has to be embedded in all of that so that it becomes the feature of the mind. Even when the mind is not meditating, even when mind is meditating, it still retains a meditative um, quality. doesn't mean that one meditates all the time, but um, because it can, first of all, it can keep quiet. It doesn't have to talk all the time, the mind. It can keep quiet. And also, it can see the usefulness of thoughts or the uselessness of thoughts. So it has to be embedded in this um, it has to be embedded in the whole of the of the teaching and not just be something separate. If we um, if we allow the mind to worry and be restless, we have no control whatsoever. So we need wise consideration to get rid of that. And if we do, then we have something to be glad about and experience joy as a beginning even for the meditation. All this reflection on the absence of any of these hindrances is to bring joy so that the meditation can start properly. In the um, transcendental depend arising, the um, cause and effect sequence is knowing dukkha in oneself, hearing the true Dhamma and gaining confidence in it, and because of that, then having joy of the path and then going to the meditation. So the joy is the necessary step for the meditation. The joy can be aroused through loving kindness. It can be aroused through the knowledge that these um, hindrances are not there at that time. That's another explanation from the commentary. A slave, with the help of a friend, gives money to his master and frees himself from slavery. From then on, he can do whatever he wishes. Similarly, a meditator thinks restlessness and worry are a major cause of harm. So he develops six things and abandons the hindrance of restlessness and worry. So one thinks this is a harm. One understands one's own thinking process. Huh? When he has thus abandoned restlessness and worry, then just as a free man can do whatever he wishes, and no one can forcibly prevent him from doing so, so the meditator happily practices the way of renunciation. And restlessness and worry cannot forcibly prevent him from doing so. Now, renunciation is all those aspects that are part of this pathway, moral discipline, restraint of the senses, mindfulness comprehension, and contentment. These are all renunciations of worldly desires, renunciation of worldly entanglements. And therefore the exalted one says that the abandonment of restlessness and worry is like freedom from slavery. Now we come to the fifth of the hindrances. Having abandoned doubt, he dwells as one who has passed beyond doubt, unperplexed about wholesome states, purifies the mind from doubt. Now this is a very short statement only about doubt, but there's more 
to come, um, unperplexed about wholesome state. A person who hasn't practiced very often, and the questions come up over and over again, they don't, such a person is not clear what is a wholesome state and what is not. And it's very simple if we can remember these five hindrances. Anything that leads to them is unwholesome. Anything that renounces those five hindrances is wholesome. Very simple. All we have to do is remember five things. Sensual desire, ill will, dullness and drowsiness, restlessness and worry, and doubt. Just remember those five. Anything that leads to them is unwholesome, that leads away from it is wholesome. Now, the six things to overcome the um, doubt, much learning, again, the same thing, learning about the Dhamma, questioning, questioning the Dhamma, so that one is quite clear what it means, And one of the things which is so important and which is something that I'm sure you were doing this month here um, have a chance to experience is making the connection. Why should one not kill mosquitoes? Making the connection to hate. Making the connection from hate to the inability to meditate. All these connections have to be made by one's own mind. I try to uh, set it up for you so that you can see it, but you'll have to make the connection yourself. So, why should one eat moderately? To counteract greed. Why should one counteract greed? Because one can't meditate when one has greed for essential gratification, and so on. These are just the very, um, their connections. They are, they are, the whole thing connects together. Everything has to be practiced. Go a lot. And as we practice, each one helps another one. And they all work together, and eventually the purification has taken place, and the whole thing falls into place and the whole thing is easy then. Much learning, questioning, skill in those five things, which I've already mentioned several times now, moral discipline, restraint, and so on of the senses. Resolution, determination. You see, we can, the mind is a, is a magician, no? We can do anything. We can sit here and resolve to doubt. Very simple. Anybody can do that. But we can also resolve to have confidence and just go ahead. I always compare that with learning to swim. If we don't have any confidence in the swimming teacher, we are not going to get into that pool and lots of kids scream their heads off. They do not want to get in because they think they're going to drown. But then there are some who are more trusting and they allow the teacher to take them to the pool and do the first stroke. And then they swim. Not having been able to swim before that, one has absolutely no way of proving to oneself that it is possible. Although one sees other people swimming, one still doesn't know that oneself can do it. So it's absolutely essential to have confidence. So one can resolve, as a grown-up, we can make that resolution. Resolution, determination. I'm going to do it. I'm going to have confidence in my own ability. This is very important, to have confidence in one's own ability. But also, confidence in the veracity of the teaching and the great achievement of enlightenment of the Buddha and uh, the um, 
faith in the truth of the transmission because it is a long time of transmission for 2500 years but only the mind which has both love and intelligence can do it the mind doesn't have have one missing won't do it in fact the mind that has the intelligence missing has more chances than the mind that's got the love missing. Confidence and trust is a, is a love matter of love. So that's the solution, noble friendship and suitable talk again. Same thing. So then the Buddha says, Great King, suppose a man with wealth and possessions were traveling along a desert road where food was scarce and dangers were many. After some time he would cross over the desert and arrive safely at a village which is safe and free from danger. He reflect, would reflect on this and as a result he'd become glad and experience joy. Again, if one doesn't have doubt, one can be joyful about it. There's a longer explanation here. As, is that it? Yes. A strong man, having taken his valuables in hand, might travel through a desert fully armed, accompanied by his retinue. Thieves, having seen him even from afar, would flee. Having safely crossed the desert and arrived at a place of safety, he would become joyful and exuberant. Similar, a meditator thinks doubt is a major cause of harm, so he develops these six things and abandons the hindrance of doubt. When he has thus abandoned doubt, then just as the strong man, fully armed, accompanied by his retinue, is fearless, taking no more account of thieves, safely leaves the desert and arrives at a place of safety, so the meditator crosses the desert of misconduct and arrives at the supreme place of safety. The deathless, the great Nibbana, therefore the exalted one says that the abandonment of doubt is like a place of safety. So then the, the Buddha says, In the same way, great king, when a bhikkhu, when a person, sees that these five hindrances are unabandoned within himself, he regards that as a debt, as a sickness, as confinement in prison, as slavery, as a desert road. So these are the five similes the Buddha gives for these five hindrances. So one ha- sees those hindrances and sees them in the way these five similes are given. But when he sees that these five hindrances have been abandoned within himself, he regards that as freedom from dead, as good health, as release from prison, freedom from slavery, as a place of safety. So one should keep both in mind that, for instance, the, uh, the first one is dead, being in debt. And not having it is freedom from death. But if one keeps that in mind, one is obviously going to look for freedom from death. Even though one may not be free from death yet, but one looks for that. And the second one, we can look at sickness and good health. Hate, being hateful is sick. And not having hate is good health. So we can verify that within ourselves any time we wish. All we have to do is be mind, have mindfulness and clear comprehension of what's going inside, on inside. And again, dullness and drowsiness is being in prison or wanting to be released from prison, freedom from slavery, the slavery or being a slave and not safe. Doubt is not safe. When one sees that these five hindrances have been abandoned, gladness arises. When one is gladdened, Rapture arises. When the mind is filled with rapture, the body becomes tranquil. Tranquil in body, one experiences happiness. Being happy, the mind becomes concentrated. So what the Buddha is actually saying is that one's got to get rid of those five hindrances. But, it is like this. They are only uprooted with the past moment and not even 
with the first past moment and not even with the second. Yeah, one is uprooted with the first past moment. And only one of them. But not even uprooted with the second past moment, only diminished. But as we have quiet here and as we hear the Dhamma more and more and as we have wise reflection within us, those hindrances need not arise at the time of meditation. If they do, the meditation is short. There's no two ways about it. There's no halfway. There's no halfway there. But at the time of meditation, they need not arise. And the more we meditate, the less they arise. It is the, the purification system through the meditative path. I always compare that to a garden full of weeds. If the weeds are allowed to grow unchecked, they take away all the nutrition out of the soil and they cover the flowers and so that the flowers cannot have sunshine or rain. So they grow and grow and grow. And it's also a feature of any garden that any gardener knows that weeds need Absolutely no fertilizer and no watering. They grow just by themselves, whereas flowers always need something. So here we have a heart and a mind full of weeds and full of flowers. So the more we check the weeds through the purification aspect of the meditation and the concentration, the weaker they become. They become puny and they do not take out all the nutrition out of our soil of heart and mind and don't cover up our beautiful flowers completely and they become weaker and weaker so that the root system becomes weaker so that eventually we can uproot them so we need to take very definite steps every time we sit down unless it has already become a habit of being able to concentrate right away but if it isn't we need to take definite steps that none of these five hindrances are allowed to come anywhere near us that we have absolute um, certainty that they are not there and then we can be joyful and as we become joyful we then with this joyfulness we have a feeling of ease in the body, this rapture which is mentioned here, that is not yet the meditative rapture, that is the, the ease in the body also. And then the mind is at ease and the body is tranquil. And with the tranquil body, then there is happiness. And with the happiness, the mind becomes concentrated. And then we just start get going. Now, There are explanations about the joy and the gladness and the showering, but they are more uh, pertain to the um, um, to the jhana state. What is said here that it's the the um, the mind which is free from disturbance has that aspect of gladness in it. And the mind that is glad, of course, the body is not, not a great uh, nuisance. And then when the concentration does come, then mind and body are both joyful and rapturous. Here's an, another a, a explanation of this um, bodily and mental happiness. The happiness of renunciation brings the happiness of excess concentration called renunciation because it has departed from the fraction of defilements and hindrances and the happiness of absorption called renunciation because it pertains to the first jhana. The excess concentration is the kind of concentration which comes before the absorption states and 
It is also called renunciation because at that time we do renounce the thinking and the defilements and the hindrances are renounced to the extent that the access to uh, the neighborhood concentration arises where the thoughts are still in the background but they do no longer they no longer impinge there is a feeling of being concentrated on the breath that's the access concentration and then of course the absorption is a real renunciation of the hindrances and that pertains to the first jhana the first jhana that we will discuss tomorrow so we, the Buddha never talked, and neither do the commentaries, about momentary concentration. That's a later development. Somebody thought about that. It's called in Pali Kanika, Samadhi, but the Buddha and the commentaries never talk about it. It's either access, it's Upachara, Samadhi, or it's um, the, uh, the full concentration, which is the absorption, which is Avijana. And the uh, access concentration is already a state of meditative progress. Whereas the momentary concentration is what we do when we dial the telephone. We've got to be concentrated not to get the wrong number. So it's not really a meditative achievement. So therefore, with the, these, this is not, not mentioned. Now here is another explanation. The phase from the abandonment of sensual desire up to the experiencing of happiness by one tranquil in body is said to be the preliminary meditative development, not absorption. So we abandon the five hindrances and there is happiness because of that tranquility which is a preliminary. But when it becomes concentrated the mind, then both the preliminary and the absorption is intended. Happiness is the cause for absorption, just as it is for the development of access, and because absorption is to be described in the formula for the first jhana, it is achieved by means of the cause and effect relationship. The preliminary happiness, the happiness of absorption is also caused for absorption concentration. So the cause and effect relationship that is mentioned here, and there are many cause and effect relationships um, which uh, we can cite, which is cited here is the abandoning of the hindrances and knowing that they have been abandoned at the time of sitting down and therefore being glad and tranquil and therefore the joy that arises leads to the absorption. Tomorrow, when I will start on the um, jhana explanations, we will also see that the jhanas themselves, the absorption, which is just the Pali word for absorption, um, counteract the hindrance. And the hindrances are like um, the headings for everything that ails us. Everything. They're the five heading, headings for everything that ails us. We can put everything else under those five headings. And as I said, we don't uproot them. But every moment of concentration is a moment of purification. So the more we cut down on those weeds, the weaker they become and the more we have the purification which brings joy and gladness and equanimity and brings with it a totally different feeling of this aliveness. Everybody has an aliveness in themselves unless one falls apart completely and becomes completely drowsy and dull. 
But if that isn't the case, one has an aliveness in, within. And this aliveness is under the sway of how many hindrances are there. And with that, we can also understand why the Buddha said, unhappiness is a defilement. So unhappiness is caused because of a defilement. It's either wanting or rejecting, therefore unhappiness. Since one of the um, aspects of abandoning the um, doubt and also abandoning restlessness and worry is questioning, now is the time for questioning. The word concentration in Pali is Samadhi. Surely you're not in Samadhi when driving a car. I hope not. You won't live very long. It's got nothing to do with concentration. It's mindfulness. Yeah, paying attention. And if you don't pay attention, you're going to run into the next uh, tree or lamppost. You've got to pay attention. So being mindful while driving is a survival mechanism. It's not a, it's not a great feat. I mean, it's survival. Sure, that's good. No, the word for concentration in Pali is samadhi. Mm. And momentary concentration in Pali is kanika samadhi. And uh, it's, it's actually contradiction in terms. There's no such thing as momentary samadhi. You know? I mean, either you've got samadhi or you haven't. <laughs> So, I mean, somebody ramped it up. The Buddha didn't. I only mentioned that because uh, some people might have heard of that uh, momentary stuff and it's, it's not really there. Yes? Well, most people do. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the object of that is to reduce the sankara. The what? The greed. The greed, the greed yes. Greed is lopa. Okay. If you want the Pali word for that. Yes. Of the reaction. Whether the, 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 the wanting, the uh, being, uh, you know, passionately desiring and wanting and um, being unhappy when one doesn't get it and all that. So you would only have to practice that discipline if there was greed involved, right? Because you can enjoy pleasant contact with beautiful things so long as there's not greed. That sounds like a nice theory. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> the uh, all unenlightened people suffer from greed and hate. They suffer from the five hindrances. Everybody. And some have more greed and some have more hate. And, uh, but everybody's got both. And the hate people, as I explained already, are hard to live with. And they find, uh, find it hard to live with themselves. But they certainly practice. Because it's so unpleasant. And uh, they usually get much faster results. And the greed people are having a nice time. They're quite easy to live with because they always think that you know, the happiness is around the next corner. And, uh, but, uh, because they are easier, but they don't practice properly. Because they always think they're going to find it out there somewhere. So as long as one thinks one's going to find it out there somewhere, it's going to be available because there are so many nice things out there, so long the practice is going to be very um, uh, fragmented. It's a very fragmentary practice because this practice leads to Nibbana, to complete freedom. And in order to have complete freedom, one's got to have freedom, freedom from all attachments. Greed is not just wanting something. Greed is being attached to. It's not a preference. It's, um, it's wanting the nice things over and over again. But if you are in a moment of suffering, just in that moment of suffering, and it's lovely, um, you can't have grief for it because it's there with you. You're called to her again. No? Well, that depends how the reaction is. I mean, you can recognize that something is um, pleasant, the recognition, but when you, if you want it again, that's grief. I don't know. <laughs> it doesn't sound quite right. <laughs> no. <laughs> you see, looking for the lovely is greed. Looking for it under in, in any manner or form. If it arises, that's fine. But looking for it, going in that direction, trying to find it, does not does not give the understanding of anicca, dukkha, anatta. Every purpose that we have in the practice is to see either anicca, dukkha, or anatta. So if there is something lovely and one is with it, one has to, as for instance the jhanas, one has to see that they are impermanent and dissolving. And if one doesn't see that, which is the unlovely and the lovely. And if one doesn't see that they're impermanent and dissolving, one thinks that's all one needs to do. And when one applies that, then at that point there can be aversion. So they can do that. So Highly unlikely. Why don't you try? Yeah. <laughs> Anything else? Yes. Does he the ten subjects of talk? Yes. I'll have to read them out to see how they are. Here, I will... Um, have to find whether it's commentary or whether it's actually the Buddha who they are. Wanting little, contentment, seclusion, 
But seclusion is also seclusion, not only physical. Seclusion is also seclusion from sensual desire. Aloofness from sense contact. That's just the guarding of the senses, huh? Aloofness from sense contact. Arousing energy. Moral discipline. Concentration. Wisdom. Liberation. Knowledge and vision of liberation. Which is sort of you. <laughs> concentration, Sila Samadhi and Panya, concentration, wisdom, and wisdom or liberation. The, the, the last, last one is from wisdom and then liberation. See, now first the moral discipline is the base, then comes the concentration, then comes the wisdom, and from that comes the liberation, and then comes the knowledge and vision of liberation. And I have to know that one has been liberated to make a review of that. So these are the ten suitable subjects of talk. Well, one can cut out quite a lot, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Did you get that, Marjorie? Yes. Yeah, okay. Right. Um, one other thing else. With the sense desires, there is another um, another um, clue that the Buddha gave, which actually goes again in the, exactly the same direction, <coughs> namely that he said that we make the mistake of trying to find the permanent in the impermanent. In other words, when we have desire in some for something or someone, whatever it may be, right? We are looking that that is going to be permanent, that promised um, satisfaction that we're going to get. So we are seeing something or someone and we think that's going to be permanent. We always forget that it's totally impermanent. So the sense desire, it's, uh, the sensual gratification itself is totally impermanent. We always forget that. So that's why we have sensual desire. And we forget that the pleasure which we get out of it is also very um, much influenced by the fact of impermanence because the pleasure disappears and then there is again the feeling of lack of being um, not fulfilled. So the pleasure because of its impermanence has pain in it because it disappears. And we also don't realize that we do not understand the, the difference between purity and impurity. So our hindrances are the impurities. And we should see that quite clearly, that these are um, making our lives difficult, never mind the meditation even, they're certainly making the meditation difficult and impossible, but they're making everything that we touch with our mind impure because of the built-in impurity in those hindrances. So if we can distinguish between purity and impurity and between the pleasure which is, has pain built in and that we are looking for the permanent in the impermanent, then our sensual desires are going to diminish greatly. And this is another, from another discourse, it's not in this one, but I thought I'd throw it in for additional <laughs> possibilities. <laughs> right. Yes. The source of the, the commentaries were written by monks, supposedly they were enlightened monks, that um, 
partially they are part of the canon so they were written before the uh, or at the time actually of the third um, great council of Arahants everything that was then recited has become canonized it's a Pali canon and the, many of the commentaries are part of the canon and they are in Pali and they were then written down at the same time but they were not by the Buddha they were by the monks who were doing the third council of Arahants they were there present but whether we don't know whether they were all Arahants there's no way of knowing oh of course you can as long as they are not just explanatory when they're explanatory they're wonderful but if they are if they uh, have an opinion, then you can don't have to accept it. But these are explanatory, and when they're explanatory, they're very useful because they give another angle of it. Please put the attention on the breath for just a few moments. Fill your heart with joy and gladness that you are able to practice that this path is open to you joy and gladness about your own goodness your own ability. Fill yourself with that joy. put your attention on the person nearest you in this room and have joy with that person's goodness with that person's ability with that person's spiritual path be joyful because he or she can do these things Transmit that joy to the person nearest you. And now have joy with everyone here. Be joyful and glad about everybody's practice, everybody's goodness and ability. Transmit that joy to everyone's heart.
Now think of your parents and have joy with them for whatever goodness they have experienced, whatever pleasures whatever successes transmit your joy to them letting them feel that you rejoice with them for anything that is bring them happiness Think of those who are near and dear to you and rejoice with them for any happiness that they experience. Rejoice with them about all the good things that they have in life. 